After World War I, France was clearly among intellectual leaders in tank design. For example, it was the engineers at Renault who created the Renault FT light tank, the first ever tank with what we now perceive as the standard tank layout. Alas, by the early 1930s, it was already outdated, and none of the attempts to create a worthy replacement were truly successful. The Renault D1 and the D2 were simply unreliable, expensive, and very heavy. That's why, after a while, the French decided to issue a specification for a cheap, light tank with a weight of six tons, inviting the French tank industry on the whole to provide proposals. Renault was still pretty much an apex predator in the industry, but there was another interesting entity eager to take on the challenge, Hotchkiss, a French arms and automobile manufacturer that wanted to explore new markets. Up to the mid-1930s, armor plates were usually attached together with rivets or bolts. This kind of plating could withstand small caliber gunfire, but would fail when hit by a sufficiently powerful round. Engineers at Hotchkiss had a solution in mind, opting for entirely cast steel hull sections instead. That allowed them to give their tank, the future H-35, up to 34 millimeters of armor at a lower cost. <laughs> Neat! Despite that, the infantry weren't ready to put their money on the Hotchkiss' untested new ideas and decided to go for the safer route, greenlighting the production of the Renault ZM, which became the R-35. This tank was armed with a coaxial machine gun and was less mobile than rival prototypes, but it met pretty much all the requirements. For one, it had a turret, while the Hotchkiss prototype had none. The team at Hotchkiss quickly made necessary adjustments and fitted the tank with a turret, but it was already too late. At the same time, their tank piqued the interest of the cavalry. They were looking for a vehicle that could replace the expensive Samoa S-35 that also took ages to make. The French had limited resources and needed lots of tanks, so the low price of a Hotchkiss H-35 became a decisive advantage. In the end, in the span of four years from 1936 to 1940, around 1,200 of those tanks rolled off the factory floor, and yeah, some of them ended up being used by infantry units as well. During production, the tank received a number of upgrades, including a new 120 horsepower engine. In 1939, after the Spanish Civil War, Hotchkiss introduced the H-39 variant, an overhaul of the previous model featuring a more powerful 37mm gun and a redesigned engine compartment. Despite all of that, the Hotchkiss was still a somewhat dated infantry tank that would do wonders on battlefields of World War I. But it was already World War II, and by that time the H-35 wasn't always up to the challenge. Its cross-country capabilities were somewhat limited. It had a few issues with survivability, and quite importantly, it lacked radio. During the Battle of France, it proved to be superior to German light tanks, but couldn't really do much when fighting the PZ KPFW-4, or the PZ KPFW-3. The H-35 was in service till the very end of World War II, and even after the war. Some of these tanks were used by the French in the colonies, and a few others were sold to Israel, where they were used until the early 1950s. Despite the fact that the design of the tank was pretty much outdated at conception, French engineers succeeded in creating a decent, combat-worthy vehicle that served their armed forces well. These days, Hotchkiss tanks enjoy a well-earned rest in museums around the world in the Israel's Armored Corps Memorial Site and Museum at Latrun, the Russian Kubinka Tank Museum and the French Museum of Armored Vehicles at Saumur. Maybe you've even seen them in one of those places? Tell us in the comments below.